Over the course of my years in ministry, many people have asked me uh, the same question. Is it, is it possible for somebody to be a Christian who refuses to live like a Christian? Or is it possible to have saving faith without evidencing any kind of spiritual walk? Or maybe it's worded this way, is a person really a Christian if they don't pray or read the Bible or go to church? Or I've heard it this way. If somebody says they got saved years ago, but now in their later years, they, they really have no desire, they say, to follow Christ. Are they truly saved? Well, these questions, no matter how they're worded, all boil down to, to one basic question. Does genuine faith have anything to do with good works? Now, frankly, any honest discussion about the gospel of Christ will sooner or later deal with the relationship between faith and works. Well, let's answer that. As, as we sail back into Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes something that, that sounds uh, maybe a little out of place to you. It's this phrase here, the obedience of faith. Now, if this phrase seems unfamiliar, it's because it appears only one other time in the entire New Testament, and that's over in the last chapter of the book of Romans. Well, here, I've just read the first of these two appearances of this phrase here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, the obedience of faith. Through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Now, we're going to deal more with the subject of grace when we get over to verse 7. But what I want to point out here at verse 5 is that Paul clearly says the purpose of his mission as an apostle is to bring about the obedience of faith among the nations. And I got to tell you, that opens the door then to asking these kinds of questions. Are faith and obedience inseparable? Can genuine faith exist without obedience? Well, in order to answer these questions, we need to understand the nature of biblical saving faith. Paul is going to write to the Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2 verse 8. So, we need to, to define saving faith. And I want to begin by defining saving faith by making some comments about what it is not. First, let me say that faith is, is not just simply agreeing with factually true uh, statements or, or things. If salvation is simply believing uh, the truth that Jesus is the Son of God or that Jesus rose from the dead, well, if that's all it is, well, every demon is a believer because they believe those truths. James writes in his book, chapter 2 and verse 19, you believe that God is one. In other words, you believe that there is only one true God. James writes, well, you do well. Even the demons believe that and shudder or tremble. Let me tell you, uh, demons today aren't doubting the resurrection of Christ. They aren't doubting that Jesus died on, a, on the cross. They know he's God in the flesh. They, they know that heaven and hell are real, but there are no demons on their way to heaven, even though they believe all of those truths. So, saving faith is not simply believing something that is historically or factually true. Secondly, Saving faith is not temporary assurance in trials that you might experience in life. Several years ago, I, I read a survey in which more than half the people polled said they believed in God, but only a fraction of those same people believed that the Bible had any authority over their, their morals or, or their personal lives. See, many people today have a vague idea of God, and it's based on some, some good fortune they've experienced. I've had people tell me, you know, I lost my job, and I prayed to God, and, and I got another job. That let me know that I was okay with God. 
I've had people tell me my child got sick, and I I prayed that that God would heal my child, and well, my child got well, so I, I know God's listening to me. Others have told me about a dream they've had or some miracle they've experienced, some near-death experience, some rescue from danger, and they'll, they'll tell me, well, that, that proved to me that, that, that I've got God in my life. Well, here's the problem. Their faith has to do with their lives on earth. Their faith has nothing to do with getting them into, into heaven. And, and their sin, by the way, if you ask them, isn't any kind of issue for them. They want nothing to do with repentance. They, they don't want to trust in, in the cross work of Christ. In other words, they, they want assurance of heaven, and they also want their sin, their sinful lives at the same time. They want to choose for themselves what's right or wrong, and yet believe that God's just going to smile on them and one day open the door of heaven. So their version of faith has nothing to do with a change in life. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, beloved, that doesn't mean that true believers don't sin. The key word John uses there is the word practice. It's one thing to practice righteous living and sometimes fail. It's another thing to not care about God's moral and ethical standards of righteousness and just keep on practicing a lifestyle of sin. And let me tell you, that isn't saving faith. And it's not your job to give people a pat on the back or some kind of false assurance. It's your job to warn them that their hope is false. They don't have true saving faith. Saving faith, then, is not merely believing in things that are true, and it's not some kind of temporary feeling of assurance about life on earth. Now, let's flip the coin over. On the positive side, what is saving faith? Well, simply put, saving faith is repentance and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for personal forgiveness and eternal life. Paul goes on, by the way, to write over there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not uh, your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of work so that no one may boast. So salvation comes through faith in Christ alone. However, genuine faith works. We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. In other words, salvation will produce a desire in your heart for obedience to Christ and good works. Uh, The lack of obedience, the lack of a desire for godly living would be evidence of a false faith and not genuine belief in Christ. So let me say it this way. Good works are not the condition for salvation. They are the consequence of salvation which means you don't do good works so that you can go to heaven, but because you're going to heaven. Good works are simply gifts of gratitude that we give back to our Savior. You might remember that that event when Paul was saved on the Damascus Road, and he immediately asked Jesus in Acts chapter 22 and verse 10, Lord, what shall I do? What do you want me to do? You see, true faith in Christ produces a desire to obey Christ. It is the action of faith that has now begun in the heart and life of a true believer. So again, here in verse 5, Paul says that his ministry is to bring about genuine faith in Christ and obedience of faith. And he mentions here in verse 5 that his ministry is unlimited. It is to the nations. In fact, the Greek word for nations here is often translated Gentiles. And that's amazing because Paul was once a proud Pharisee. And let me tell you, Pharisees didn't have anything to do about Gentiles. 
But Paul now sees his ministry as extending to everyone. He's got to tell everyone, Gentile and Jew alike, so that all may come to faith in Christ and, and everybody then who's genuinely saved will gratefully obey the Lord. A man once told me uh, some time ago over a bowl of soup that he, he by the way, hardly touched uh, that afternoon. He said, Stephen, I've been so convicted of my lack of passion for God. I wasn't living for him at the job before my family. I, I've, I became deeply convicted of that. And, and I went home after work a few days ago and confessed my lack of faithfulness to the Lord and that I wanted to make a complete break from, from my lifestyle of compromise with sin. Well, this man told me over lunch that he and his wife began to go through their home and throw things away, books, movies, music, anything that did not contribute to holy living. He told me we were up until 3 a.m. cleaning everything out. Then with tears in his eyes, he said to me, I I was tired of playing games. I wanted to be real for God. Well, let me tell you, uh, that is the obedience of faith. There's an old hymn that combines these two elements of faith and obedience. It goes like this, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, until we set sail again, beloved, on our wisdom journey, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.